This is the first time in Europe we have been face to face with our customers in two years, yeah. FHB3. How's the experience been for you? Um, what have you heard? What are you taking away? So, as I'm, I'm sure you probably feel the same, I think the great thing about Viva is the community. We, we have the great fortune to work in a phenomenal industry with bright people who want to make a difference. And you realize over the course of the pandemic, we've all functioned, but what we've lacked was this. What we lacked was that face-to-face -face interaction where we come together, you have those informal meetings, and you realize that we were living off the, the time that we spent together pre-pandemic and burning through that. And it was, it was about time we came together. So I think the feeling in the atmosphere is just uh, an eagerness to get back together. It's like the world's opening up again and people are really open to, to doing things differently, better. It's like a fresh beginning. And what do you think in terms of what you're hearing, the chatter in the corridors, the main themes of the conference? What are you taking away as the loudest sound bites? We, we talked about breaking down the barriers in, in life sciences to, uh, to, to better join it up, to make it more effective. And that really seems to have struck a chord. I think COVID really challenged the art of the possible. Um, but, but there were some constraints during lockdown as to what you could really do about it. So the industry just did stunning things. But, but now we have an opportunity to really institutionalize that and build for the future. So I think in terms of what I'm seeing and hearing, it's very much a, a, an energy, a vibe about wanting to think differently, do things differently. And on the one hand, um, believing the time is right to, to break down those barriers to, to new ways of working. But also there's a, a pragmatic balance there, which is that's great. We do believe it. Now, how are we going to make it happen? And I see this sort of um, this wonderful combination between optimism, but also pragmatism around that optimism, which to me, and I know, I know you've seen much of the same as this as myself, that's when great things happen. When, when optimism meets pragmatism, then you get enduring change. So in terms of, you mentioned barriers and you know, breaking down some of those barriers. Are there any in particular that you think are worth sharing with our audience today? Everyone is frustrated about the silo-driven approach that we currently have to, to, to R&D today. But the reality is it's also, we've got 100 years of muscle mass that, that have built up around that's how we do business. So it's frustrating, but it's comfortable. So we're going through a, a period where we've got two things coming together. We've got the, the can-do um, demonstration of what people can do under pressure that the pandemic brought us. And we've got the advent of technology that genuinely connects and joins things up. The challenge therefore becomes that there's really no reason why we can't do this now, other than the fact that there's, there's a muscle mass and inertia around doing the things that we've always done. And I think this is, this is where you know, you can see some of the folks here today, they, it, it's going to be so vital that they maintain that optimism, that energy, that can do to break through those barriers and, and say, no, there is a better way. And it's OK. You know, we, we don't need to waste our time working in silos. There's a better way. And do you think, I've, I've discussed with a few people, do you think COVID was a trigger for that or just a convenient passing of time for us to anchor onto? I, I'm probably more of the view, having seen cycles of this come and go, um, that it was a turning point. I think, I think it removed the excuses. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm wonderfully optimistic right now that you know, we heard from Roche today, the, the, the fact that they were able to introduce a whole new medical testing device in months during a lockdown, that was spectacular. And they, they really had to think differently, act differently. And the, the greatest risk that I think we have right now is that we squander that. Because there's a feeling and a mood now that if we, if we take it, we could do great things. 
But if we let ourselves go back to business as usual, then all the old excuses of why these things are too difficult might sneak back in. And what do you think your role and Viva's role in kind of continuing that journey is likely to be? And having spent my entire career, uh, and you know, obviously as you know, I'm very old, um, having spent my entire career trying to make technology-led transformation for the life sciences industry really stick and make a, make a difference, there was just this enduring flaw that the technology wasn't up to it. And trying to stitch the bits together was a fantasy. It looks great on PowerPoint, but never really worked in reality in the long term. So the bit that excited me about Beaver was that here was a ground up technology done properly right first time that would endure over time. And with that, I think our role has gone from, first of all, really, really give the industry great capabilities to join up internally. I think this next wave we're on though is really quite special, which is helping the industry to connect into the ecosystem. And I think our, our responsibility, and you know, I don't choose those words lightly, is that if anyone was going to enable the breaking down of barriers, we, we are blessed, fortunate, um, in that we support so much of the industry. We have a responsibility to, to therefore help the industry raise the level of productivity by removing all of those worthless administrative tasks that people were forced into because the technology didn't work together. I think it's interesting you put it that way. I think one of the things that strikes me as well is it's showing a path so that the past doesn't inhibit the future. Yeah. Because uh, I think you said it very well early on, there's a hundred years of muscle mass, muscle memory stuck in what we do, yeah. and it's time to change. I think the other thing that's really struck me in the presentations and the keynotes, patient centricity and site centricity have to start meaning a lot more than they've ever meant before. Yeah. That's not to say they were ignored before, I might debate that, but the point is they genuinely have to start meaning something. But along that way, it's every user, which brings you back to sponsors. Yeah. And I do think it's that playoff between sponsors, sites, and patients that is yeah. going to be critical. The magic happens when you stop dealing with each item in, uh, in separation and you start connecting the dots. And when we do that, then, then you have a chance to change the whole economics of the industry for the better. So let me, let me take that one step further. Um, the buzzword of our industry is my, fa my least favorite phrase, which is decentralized clinical trials. Yeah. So I'm going to park that, but I'm going to go with digital trials. Yeah. We've talked a lot and we've heard a lot from our uh, attendees here about digital trials. Yeah. What's your take about how that's going to continue to change the industry and where we're going to play a role in that? I go back to what are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to get the right patients into the right trials in as an efficient way as possible, recognizing that the, the individuals are, are in many cases suffering through some pretty nasty illnesses. And so we bear a duty of responsibility to accelerate that process to bring medicines to the, the, the broader population for making sure the right people turn up to those studies and uh, to make sure that the experience while they're on it is as, as painless and unobtrusive as possible. So to me, I, I always slightly worry about the word digital, um, which as you know, in my consulting days, I did a lot of digital programs because actually I'd flip it round. I, I, would, I would almost sort of say this is a, um, this is a, a patient-driven problem, both in terms of right patients, right trials, right time, right experience, but then an acceleration so that the, the ultimate patients, once the drug is launched, um, can, can get benefit from it. So it's actually about joining the dots, and it's a very human thing, but using technology to achieve that aim. So if we could give you a magic wand that you could wave tomorrow, yeah. are there two things in this industry that you wish you could start doing yeah. that you can't do today? Yeah. And are there two things you wish you could just you know, put into room 101 and, and cast into the f forever ago not to be repeated? 
so I, I think for me, I'm impatient around the, this whole notion about what we can do in clinical. So I, I'd like to go all in with my two yep. and, um, a, a, and get to a point where we can enroll patients, we can capture their data, and we can share that with the investigators, sites, sponsors, with CROs um, seamlessly integrated in uh, to a point where we've, we've increased the access to the right patients for the right studies, and we've accelerated the process, and the patients who've gone through that have, have um, had a better, less obtrusive um, uh, experience. So, you know, distill down, if I, could, if I could say, you know, I want to be there today with a great patient experience, and I'd like to be there today with an integrated network to enable that. Things I'd love to stop doing. Um, in some ways, I, I would almost like a collective amnesia for the industry right now, and, and specifically um, around we must do things this way. I think we've got a chance to, um, if not tear up the rule book, we've got a chance to revisit it in a really radical and fundamental way. And it doesn't matter what we do in terms of creation of a platform and a technology. It, it really requires the, the, the incredible people out there in the industry to, to really embrace it with both hands. So, you know, I think collective amnesia while we go through these programs would be a, a wonderful thing. Now, what's it like for the patient? What's it like for the investigator? You know, how do we make better studies? And how do we actually make a difference from that? And so, you know, I think, I think on both sides, and you probably sense it, it's an impatience that, that, you know, back to this duty, we have to do this, and we have to do it as quickly as possible.